Go with me on, in the scripture, Matthew 7, verse 21. How many of you enjoyed the messages that we preached on, on grace? Amen. And uh, I know that a lot of people are taking it out of context that are watching us online or those who are not in the church. Also, a lot of people have been blessed. We've been getting messages from all over the world. Uh, we have been getting messages literally from all over the world of people saying how they are set free from this message. Listen, uh, Centurion might be small here, but obviously we got Krugersdorp as well. We got Cape Town as well. Are you guys with me? And um, uh, uh, we got our online church as well. And then we have people all over the world that are watching as normal broadcasting that are being touched by these services. So the moment I began to preach, uh, can you lose your salvation? That message just went viral, really went viral. One of our messages that contains that, a part of that in, I think is over 150,000 views on, uh, on live stream. So it went viral and uh, some countries are not happy with it. I didn't find a lot of opposition from South Africa for a strange reason. I'm not sure why or not yet. Um, but uh, I'm sure there's some ministers that hate that. I know some ministers, some big ministers that says to me they don't like hyper grace and they think I preach hyper grace. And we're not speaking. Hyper grace is something different. Hyper grace says that you can carry on sinning the way you want to and have no character of God. But let me just say that that is an abuse of the word of hyper grace. Grace is hyper. Otherwise, you would not be sitting here. Are you guys with me? So grace is hyper. Otherwise, you would not be sitting here. If God's grace was not hippos, which is it in the Greek, which is hyper, your blood, would, your, your sins would not be forgiven by the blood. And uh, the first sin that tripped you up would have, would have taken you out. So, 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 you know, they say that we preach hyper grace. Don't listen to that nonsense. We preach the grace of God relative to justification, sanctification. When it comes to character, that's a whole different thing. Don't throw it into the same box. When it comes to the character of Christ, the image of Christ, being conformed to the image of Christ, it is now a different story because that means that I have to have a character, a witness, a, a Christian character or a Christ-like character and able to witness and to be a good testimony and witness to people out there. Are you guys with me? So, so it is a... Um, it is a uh, 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 it is it is having a good character. So we're not we're not there yet. So people think and assume because we're not touching on that that we are saying that they that we are ignoring that. No, we're working with salvation because fifty percent of the church here. You're going to hear this morning. I bet you. Possibly, I hope not, but possibly, fifty percent of the church here is not saved. Are you guys with me? So I'm going to flip the coin a little bit from beautiful grace message to something else. Okay, because um, people have to understand salvation. People have to understand, uh, people have to understand the work of salvation. If there's one thing I want to do is I want to open up the Bible to our church. I don't like it when preaching is just stories or this or that. They must be scripture. And there must be an exposition of the scripture. There must be an exegesis of the scripture. There must be a, a, a opening up of the scripture. And there must be scripture interpreting scripture. Um, that is the correct way of preaching, rightly dividing the word of truth. So, so um, when I preach, I do that. So my assignment, listen, I have two assignments. My one assignment is to plant the church. And my other assignment is to prophesy. So I stopped prophesying for about two years properly because I had some suckers. Uh, they wouldn't know who I'm talking Maybe they will know, so I can't say who they are, otherwise it's dishonoring. But uh, to tell me that, you know, you must lay down your mantle. Mega church pastors. You must lay down your mantle. You know, you must lay down your mantle. Just lay it down. It's too much. Then I realized two years later, are these you know, fools want me to lay down my mantle so that we can't be effective so that they can be effective. Really, really. And uh, so I laid down my mantle and I taught the word and I, and I, and, and, and it was fine. And uh, we still showed that our church is not maintained by prophecy. And our ch church is not fanaticized by prophecy. It doesn't matter what all the keyboard warriors are thinking. That crowd up there, there is fickle. I don't care about them. I care about them if they are in our online church 
and they are committed. But I don't care if they are just fickle people, some apostle in their mother's basement that's trying to, people sending me these articles. I think I got about, yesterday, I think I got about 30 articles, 30 articles written against us. I'm thinking, listen, you might as well just write a book. I'm helping you to write a book. You can go ahead, uh, you know, um, while we will be doing the work of the kingdom. So, so, uh, uh, but... Um, we, you know, they have also been sending, these people that are writing these articles have also been sending it to other people in their inboxes. So that is why you need to know the word of truth. So if you sit under our ministry, that these, you know, the more wide and the more known we become, there's a curse to it as well, where people really try to shut you down. There's a reason I stay silent regarding our next project, because I can only reveal it at a certain time, which I will reveal to you. And it will be glorious and it will be soon. Are you guys with me? We've already made purchases, everything. We've already spent over 16 million rand the last two months. And we need a hundred more, okay? But we spent over 16 million rand. So, so uh, but in the right time, it'll be revealed. So, because you have people, the wider your influence spread, you have people that want to stop you. You know, there's a man out there um, you know, that used to be part of my spiritual family and so on, but that vowed that they will not die unless they see my ministry destroyed. Now, I understand the Saul and a David syndrome, and maybe it is one of those things, and I won't dishonor, but I have to keep on doing what God is doing, but God is not going to allow that um, because the assignment, the mantle, and the angel of the Lord has shifted on. So when this church was planted, an angel was placed by this pulpit of this church called the angel of encounter and from there every time god tells us to plant a church that angel is present when the lord told me to plant uh krugersdorp that angel was present on the second floor of that um building when we were busy building the building in krugersdorp on the second floor the angel came to me and, uh, and, and, and ministered to me. The same with Cape Town. Are you guys with me? So let's, let's get to, the, so I need to, I need to give you a message this morning and I want to, I want to, um, I don't know how to say it, exposition or exegetic, exeget, exeges or exeget or uh, just let me know, just say open up, line upon line, precept upon precept, the word to you. Um, and I'm just going to get into some a few things. So that's why I teach. And then, you know, when it comes to other services and evenings, just this morning is going to be teaching. Other mornings we'll get back into prophecy while preaching and teaching and so on. I wanted to move to a financial series. And the Lord said, no, I must carry on with this tool. So I need to go with what the agenda is. I believe there's a great deliverance revival that broke out. But it's going to become very legalistic unless God brings in a move of grace. That is why on the mouths of many prophets right now is the message of grace. God has literally installed it into the mouths and the spirits of many prophets uh, to bring in the wave because God does nothing unless He reveals it to His servants, the prophets. So if He reveals to me a wave of grace that is coming, it means a wave of grace that is coming. Otherwise, because of all this deliverance stuff, people are going to go back into legalism, which has already been happening. Are you guys with me? So I've been attacked as brutally as, as much as the testimonies people have received. I've also been attacked on this brutally because they don't understand or they are full of legalism. So the spirit of religion is manifesting in them. I just never had this in my life. I never had this legalistic side inside of me. I might have preached legalism in a way, but I, it was never really a part of me. I could never really be at peace with this. So go to Matthew 7, 21. Let me read to you something. Those who are online, uh, keep watching. Share the broadcast for us on Facebook. Tag somebody. Click the thumbs up button on YouTube right now. I want everybody on YouTube. I can see you here. Everybody on YouTube, click the thumbs up button for us, please. Uh, that'll help. Matthew 7, 21. It says, so the message basically this morning is, say with me, am I 100% sure I am saved? You might say yes now, but let's wait, okay? Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now we understand the context of this message where Jesus says, I never knew you. 
depart from me. So these were people that God never knew. Are you guys with me? Let's read it in context. Verse 22. Many will say to me in the day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Man, I'm losing my voice already because of the sound. Have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. Next verse. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So listen to this. There are 50% here, most probably, in a normal church, if we are really, if I've taught the word to you correctly, and you had an awesome regeneration experience, and it shows certain fruits, there might be less than 50%. But there is going to be a group of people here that falls into the category of God never knowing you. Are you guys with me? So, so, so meaning that not everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will enter heaven. I'm going to ask you that usually I'm off preaching without notes. You've seen me done it for years. But I want to take this message on my notes because it is quite a, it is, it is a message that can get backlash and I want to present it correctly. Is that okay? Um, so, so meaning a lot of people in the church are going to think that they're going to heaven, but they are not, uh, you know, um, you can only come to God on His terms and not on our own terms. So many people preach a gospel and they preach the gospel and then the people who receive it receive Him on their terms. Celebrities receive Him on their terms. Oh, trust me, I've seen it and I've worked with a couple of them. They receive God on their terms and salvation has not done its full work. Provenient grace is not coming, and I'll explain it right now. Salvation has not done its full work, so they go back to their old lifestyle. Are you guys with me? When you truly receive salvation, you will not go back to your own lifestyle. But listen, every single one of us have sin. Ecclesiastic 7.20. Ecclesiastic 7.20 says, There's not just a man upon the face of the earth that does good and sinneth not. For there's not a just man on earth who does good or sins not and does not sin. Meaning there has to be a genuine salvation that takes place upon a people. Let me explain to you. And I'm going to try to preach very fast because it's a long message and I need to get it out to you completely this morning before I go. And I want to pray for you at the end. So when the message is not preached correctly, are you with me? Are you with me, church? If you don't witness to, uh, correctly to someone, you go the risk to have that soul think they receive salvation, but they don't receive salvation. And this is such a serious um, commission that Paul says to, Testimo, uh, Paul says to Timothy, that be a student, study the words, to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. Are you guys with me? So, so when the gospel is preached in a wrong way, the blood does not do its effective work. And because the blood does not do its work, that soul is unable to get saved. That's why your friend that you've ministered to is still in the world. Because now we have to get back to 101 basics, evangelism, Christianity 101. To say, how do I lead somebody to the Lord? Do I use the correct wording? Do I use the correct phrasing? Everything is about words. Everything. God said to Adam, Adam, whatever you name the animal, so it shall be. By your words. Samuel, the Lord called to Samuel and Samuel said, yes, Lord, here am I. And the Lord said nothing to him. Then he went to Samuel. Then Samuel says, no, no, you're saying the wrong words. You must say these words. And when he went back to, 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 to the Lord and the Lord spoke to him again, then he said, here are my Lord. Here's your servant, Lord. Speak. And he used different words, meaning that there is words that heaven responds by. And when words are not used correctly, 
which is the which is where we get the phrase preaching from if preaching is that's not it's not done correctly the hearts of people are not touched are you guys with me you look thoroughly bored you can go back home Are you guys with me? So when I preach the gospel wrong, I prevent prevenient grace from working in someone's life. Prevenient grace, have four people up for me here quickly. I hope I'll finish with this. If I don't finish with it, it's okay. I can actually finish it next week. It is, it is okay. Um, I'll go as the Holy Spirit leads. So, this is the person before he gets saved. Are you guys with me? Provenient grace. And I want you to understand these truths and write it down. It's very important for your own salvation. It's very important for many false doctrines that are out there. It's many imp- very important for all the seeker-sensitive churches that are now speaking about a universal God bringing in new age and then of the audacity to say I am new age there are more preachers new age today that is on TBN that are you that you are following that mega churches that you that's that I am new age and I'm a prophet if there's anybody that should be touching a little bit new age levels it is a prophet because new ages took it from prophets okay are you guys with me clairvoyance clairvoyance clairaudience Ecclesians, everything is taken from prophets. So when you listen to a psychic that's operating in clear audience, don't think it is, oh, the devil created it. No, 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 no. Clear audience simply means to hear in the spirit. Clairvoyance, are, are you guys with me? Clairvoyance means to see. But anyway, uh, your, 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 uh, uh, so, so, he's the ungenerate person, unsaved. He's the saved person, just saved person. He's the being saved person, and he's the glorified person. So, the unsaved person, somebody comes and ministers to him. But if the person that ministers to him, there's a lot of feedback on this mic, guys. We need the right sound, guys, out, please. When there is a a wrong person or ministering to him wrongly, the grace of God cannot be present for his heart to shift, to actually receive Christ completely. So he can even do the sinner's prayer out of an intellectual mind. And I can walk away and think I want a soul, but I want nothing. And then this person can think they're going to heaven, but they're not going to heaven. It's called the apostate church. Are you guys with me? That's what happened in AD 70 with the church of Laodicea. In fact, they were, they were actually questioning whether the church of Laodicea was fully, was actually none of them were believers. But anyway, so, so, but now if I'm a believer and I understand the power of provenient grace, Provenient grace is before justifying grace. Provenient grace is what gives the person an opportunity for them to respond in faith. Because it's by grace through faith. Are you guys with me? So now provenient grace is here. Now through faith he can respond. So now grace is like a bubble that comes to him. A moment in time of five seconds or so. Where he will now have the ability and the choice to accept the work that was done on the cross or not accept the work that was done on the cross. And if he misses that moment, then he falls into the category where the Bible says that no man shall stand before God without an excuse. So every single person on the planet will have prevenient grace. Whether somebody preaches to them or whether they know God by their own conscience, And in their own conscience, if they are in a place where there's no gospel being preached, Romans chapter number one, there's a judgment on the conscience. Are you guys with me? God is not an unfair God. He will have no one stand in front of Him who has not been given an opportunity. 
to respond to the gospel, even if it's in a conscious manner by looking at nature. Are you guys with me? So now he responds and he says yes. The moment he says yes, grace now works in him. Because grace works in him, he's justified immediately. He's saved immediately without works. There's nothing he has to do. The only thing he had to do was acknowledge and confess his sin. Number two was to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, to confess that Jesus is Lord. We call it the ABCs. Three things he had to do. He just had to acknowledge, I'm a sinner. He had to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord in his heart. And then he had to confess with his mouth that Jesus unto salvation, that Jesus Christ is Lord and the blood has forgiven him and the blood has washed him. Now he's justified. This is forever. Hey, the sound guys. Are you guys with me? I'm going to hold the mic here, and if I'm keeping holding it closer, please don't drop it because you guys are killing my voice, okay? So, once here, he is forgiven completely. Now, this grace doesn't end here. It started with prevenient grace. It's justifying grace. Now it moves on to sanctifying grace. Once I get to sanctifying grace, this grace is still working. And it is saying... That as I am in a sanctifying grace, there's nothing I have to do out of myself. It is God that does good works in me. If my salvation was true at prevenient grace, God does the works. You would want to pray. You would want to read the words. You would want to be kind to people. You would love people. You would serve people. I don't know if you guys understand what I'm saying. You'll be full of joy. There'll be a change of nature on the inside of you. Now from here we move on and that's the grace that is working in your life. Now it is like the Bible is saying, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, but it is God that works in us, both to will and to do. And in the book of Peter, he says that this is the keeping power of God. That this is where God keeps you. You don't have to keep yourself. There's a deception that is being preached to say, yeah, you have to maintain, you get your salvation without works, but now you have to maintain it with good works. It's a deception. Are you guys with me? The sound is bad, so I know it is not traveling or anything like that. Can you hear me? Can you understand? This stuff must be sorted, eh? Don't think there that it's all good. If you take the mic, it's not good. So, yeah. is sanctifying grace, meaning that it keeps me, God keeps me. There's no work I have to do to maintain or keep my salvation. If I do that, I move into self-worship. Now the same grace that is sanctifying me is the same grace that will glorify me one day. That will give me my glorifying body. That will give me my heavenly body. And that will complete. So what is happening by sanctification? So what is happening at justification? My spirit is saved. Are you guys with me? My spirit gets saved. What's happening at, at sanctification? My soul is being saved. What is happening at glorification? My body, my flesh will be saved one day. So salvation will have its full work through the grace of God. But it is by His grace and not of our works and not of our law. Does that mean that we cannot, mustn't come and pray? Mustn't? No, 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 no. That is to align yourself with God and to kind of like make this process easier because I'll get into a gospel after this one is correctly. I'll begin to preach on the new man. So many people are waiting for the glorification where in eternity there is no time. And the Bible says that we have, all things have passed away and all things become new. And those who are in Christ Jesus have become a new kainos, a new creation, which is here. Which means that when people look at you, they look at you as if you are here already. They look at you with the image of Christ on you. They look at you like you are a kainos creation. Are you guys with me? You carry the image of Christ. He is the firstborn of many brethren. He's not the only born of many. He's the firstborn, which means that there are many coming after him like him. But we cannot get to kainos unless we understand justification, the grace of God. 
the goodness of God, the good news of the gospel. Have your seats. Are you guys with me? Timothy, the good news. This is the good news. Do you know how many people, you know, people think I answer comments on Facebook because I'm offended. Oh, I'm so beyond offended. It's entertainment. Okay. I'm sitting and laughing and answering this one. And then this preacher is upset with me. Then I'm answering him there. And I say to this preacher that is very hurt by, maybe he watches this, that is very hurt from, all the way from Texas. That's very hurt maybe by a previous move. Maybe like somebody that went into universalism, maybe like Colton Pearson or so. And uh, because of that hurt, you have switched the pendulum way to the other side. And if you're not going to fix it, you're going to hurt the people more than what you were hurt. You're watching from Texas. I love you. But you're putting people into bondage. So it's a big minister that contacted me. And they say that we have to buffet our bodies to keep our salvation. Paul says, I buffet my body to keep it under subjection so that I am not disqualified. Guys, let's read the Bible in context. Can I at least teach you an encounter if those online don't understand? Are you telling me you have to... Now, when Paul buffered his body, he beaded his face black and blue at his mouth because he had a problem of unbelief and talking negatively. Okay. So... And he had a messenger of Satan, an accuser sent against him, and he didn't want to speak against him, so he had to buffer his own mouth. That is how serious he took his apostleship. But are you telling me now I have to buffer to my body, which means beat my body, to keep my salvation? Common sense is not so common with some people. <sighs> da -da -da. So you understand prevenient grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace, and glorifying grace. Are you guys with me? And I, I, I endeavor to teach you here, guys. I really endeavor to teach you here. Um, I hope this is not going to be a... If it is a two-part series, it is really fine. It is really fine. It is really fine because I think it might be too much for you. I realize that I can't throw out a hundred scriptures. It's going to be too much. I think we might have to make it a two-part series, which will be very good. Um, but then you must attend the second part. Um, so some conversions and some salvations are false. Okay, they are false. They are, um, as I just explained to you now, when provenient grace is not present, we get now to a place of the ten virgins. I haven't even touched or taught on the ten virgins. I haven't touched and taught on the mystery of the parables. So please be, like I said, under, be in a church that understands the word, that doesn't just throw out nonsense to you and their opinions. There are so many people that are throwing out opinions. They're throwing these scriptures out to us. People throwing out a scripture. Um, let me get it for you. Um, uh, uh, go with me to Revelation chapter number... Um, Revelation chapter number, um, I think it is, um, Revelation 3 verse 16, listen to this, Revelation 3 16, I like the chair though, I think I need to get a chair up here, then if I want to preach I run, and if I want to sit I can sit, but anyway, maybe it'll make the church uh, seek a sense of I don't know. So then, listen to this. No, 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 this is not the one I'm looking for. Looking for, sorry, 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 sorry. This is not the one I'm looking for. I'm actually looking for this one. Go with me to Revelation 3, 5. Sorry, 3, 5. Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh, so that he that overcometh, Say, the same shall be clothed in white. And I will not, say, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Does it say he will blot out your name? He says, I will not blot out his name. 
What are the conditions? Very simple. Are you overcomers through Jesus Christ? Has He had victory on the cross? Does the Bible say that you are more than an overcomer? Mm. Clothed in white, are you washed with the blood? Are you dressed in white garments? Which are you made the righteousness of Christ, righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? That means your name will not be blotted out. That means that you've accepted the blood of the Lamb. You've accepted the atoning work of the blood. And your name is not and cannot be blotted out. So don't ever think of this verse. Come on, are you guys with me? What are we speaking about? We are speaking about a series called Assurance of Salvation. Have your seats, have your seats. Even though I called it, are you 100% sure you're saved? Which we will land next week. But... Uh, the assurance of salvation. And you see why it is important to know the assurance because you can never operate in glory unless you know the assurance of your salvation. You can never minister to anybody effectively unless you know the assurance of your salvation. Are you guys with me? So they throw the scriptures and then they throw out vomit and all this stuff and God vomits us out of our mouth and everything is taken out of context. But it is fine. So listen, as we're getting into the series, we're dealing with uh, uh, two types of Christians. So when I speak of false conversions, you have people that are falsely saved. They think they are saved, but they are not. So, or many have been allowed to crept into the sheepfold without going through the door. So they speak the Christian lingo. They raise their hands. They're in the midst of you here but they don't have the assurance of salvation. That's why it's very important to come back next week so that we can close this thing off and end it off properly. Uh, because without next week, you're not going to understand and not going to have the conviction. And you're going to see how the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, righteousness, and judgment before you are saved to get onto salvation. And then He witnesses in you that you are a son of God. Are you guys with me? So many people become what we call mannequin Christians. They look real from far. But once you get close and you really poke at them, or you touch them, and you try to feel and see if there's life, you realize there's no life. But from far off, they look like actual real people. They can be dressed in a certain way. They can uh, look a certain way. Uh, the, everything about them looks correctly, but it has to take somebody to get close up to look at evidences to see are they a real Christian or are they not? Did they truly experience salvation or not? And it is my duty to make sure that the whole church of encountered is truly saved because then we can go to the next step, which is saved, serving. And then maturing, meaning. Or saved ministry, maturing, meaning. A lot of people first want to mature before they can do ministry. While the Bible says you must first do ministry, then you can be mature. You will never mature unless you do ministry. Are you guys with me? Ephesians chapter number 4, 11. You will never mature unless you do ministry. Now what we have created is we've created a congregation and a people that wants to serve and wants to mature first before they think they can do any ministry. They want to mature first before they think they can run an e-group. You will never mature. You only mature by doing ministry. And so we have slowed down the move of God and the advancing of the kingdom because we want to mature people before using them in ministry. And I'm not speaking of serving. I'm speaking of ministry. Are you guys with me? So I'm not speaking of serving. I'm speaking of ministry. A lot of people don't want to do ministry because I don't think and I don't believe their salvation experience was full and whole and genuine and true. Because you're going to see now the signs and the evidences. I'm, my stomach is a bit sore, so I'm just talking. Is that okay? If I scream and I can't hear myself with a the mic, then I, I, I get a bit sore. So there's a lot of people that are not saved because they think that they are saved through their works. Or they think that they are saved by their works. Or they maintain or keep their salvation through their works. 
And because of that, there's no genuine salvation. Are you guys with me? What's going on? Oh, okay. Just don't be distracting while you do that. So go back to Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Say with you, the will of my Father. So there are two types of Christians that we're addressing in this, in this series. There's a lot of Christians who are saved, but they live in fear and doubt, and they don't know or they doubt their salvation. They don't have full assurance, but they are saved. Then there are other Christians who are not saved, but they think they are saved. Are you guys with me? These are the two, uh, these are the two, um, two types of people. So I want to just give you the purpose of this message. The purpose of this message is to remove condemnation, is to remove any guilt from you, is to bring you to a place where you can receive salvation, enjoy salvation, have rest in salvation, have a joy upon you, incredibly love God, have an assurance of your salvation, and actually go and preach the gospel and know that you have a creator of a universe that can preserve you until the end. And that there's no such thing as an endurance gospel where you must endure to the end. It is nonsense. Are you guys with me? I hope, I don't have much power in my speaking because I'm a bit of pain, but I hope my words can get to you. There is no such thing as an endearing gospel. Many will say to you, you must endure to the end to be saved. That was speaking of a different time period. It was speaking of AD 70. It wasn't speaking of today. You are in the dispensation of the grace of God, of the kingdom of God. Are you guys with me? Because what if you endure your whole life and that five seconds before you died, you stopped enduring? So these things don't make practical sense. Are you guys with me? So I haven't even got into it. We'll get into it right now. So I want you to, so the purpose of this message is for no condemnation. It's to know that you are a child of God. Yes, there are people here who are saved, but they doubt their salvation. They have fear and they actually hope that one day they will be saved. Then there are people here who think they are saved, but they are not saved. Now, how do we distinguish between the two? Let's get into it. Are you guys with me? Say with me, evidences that I'm saved. Online, let us know if you're enjoying it by putting a fire emoji. And then uh, share the broadcast. So evidences that a person is saved. The number one evidence, say with me, fruit. If a person is really saved, they will have the fruit of salvation. So Matthew 7 verse 20. Read me Matthew 7 verse 20, just before 21. We read to you verse 21 right now, but let's do Matthew 7 verse 20. Whereby their fruits you shall know them. Wherefore, by their fruits, say with me, by their fruits, you shall know them. This is tricky because an apple tree can be an apple tree without fruits. And it can take time before an apple tree actually begins to bear fruits. Are you guys with me? It can also be that an apple tree never bears fruits, but it's still an apple tree. So I want to go as far to say that even if a Christian never bears fruit, he's still a Christian. So what I'm saying with the evidences, I'm not saying that if you're just missing one of these evidences that you are not a Christian. I'm saying, and I'll tell you right at the end of the message, which won't be today, what is the three steps on how to make sure of your salvation? How you can 100% make sure of your salvation? That won't be today. But uh, I can have an apple tree and that apple tree can never even bear fruit. Yet it's an apple tree. So you can't really fully, uh, so fruit is an indicator, but it is not a requirement. 
Are you guys with me? What I'm saying here, guys, the next evidences I'm going to give you, except for one or two that I will tell you, are not requirements, but they are indicators. They are evidences, but not requirements of salvation. Does that make sense? So an apple tree can be young and they cannot produce, and then they can make grow older, they can produce. So fruit uh, takes long. Um, uh, uh, if fruit never appears, we can have an argument and say, but wait, maybe something is wrong here. Maybe this person's salvation is not true because we don't see fruit. So I'm not saying we can say it as a certainty, but we can say maybe. Are you guys with me? If a Christian, now first of all, let me just say this. What is the fruit? What fruits must a Christian bear? A Christian must bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which is the nine fruits of the Spirit. And number two, they must bear the fruits of productivity. So the fruits of the Spirit is to make you like the image of Christ. Are you guys with me? Love, patience, goodness. And we can go through all the fruits, long-suffering, temperance. And we can go through the fruits of the Spirit, the nine fruits of the Spirit. When those fruits begin to take place in your life, it is a sign and an evidence of salvation. And then when there's fruits of productivity, you're actually beginning to serve. There's actually some fruits of productivity. You're beginning to make disciples. People are catching and being discipled by you. It's now fruits that are being produced. But I cannot say because of that somebody is saved. Are you guys with me? It's an evidence. So I cannot say because they have these things in their lives, they are saved. But I can also not say because they don't have these things in their lives, they are not saved. It is just evidences for self-reflection. Uh, for you to reflect in yourself, do I have fruits in my life? Or have I just carried on the devil that I used to be? Okay. So a real Christian will eventually begin to produce fruit in their lives. Are you guys with me? Number two, I think we might only get to number two. Um, because I, I, if I'm going to go further, I'm going to mess up this message. I'm really going to mess up this message. I wanted to go. I wanted to, um, I wanted to land really hard with you next week. The second evidence, you will have a desire to stop sinning. Say with me, a desire to stop sinning. Now, if we get to sin, that's something I will teach on later. Okay, but let's get to just the evidence of a desire to stop sinning. So 1 John 3 verse 9 says this. It says, whoever is born of God does not commit sin. I'm going to say it again. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin. Say with me, if I'm born of God, I do not commit sin you cannot commit sin it says for his seed remains in him and he cannot say it again say I do not and say I cannot say it again say I do not I cannot don't get upset with me get upset with the Bible it means that sin Mm. I can give you the mature interpretation or can give you the sugar-coated interpretation. If I must give you the mature interpretation, everybody online is going to backslide. Those some in you are going to backslide. If I give you the sugar-coated interpretation, maybe we can go on. Let me give you the mature interpretation first. Colossians 2.11. Colossians 2.11. In Him... You were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You know what this means? Come on, are you sleeping? Do you know what this means? It means that the body that you're committing sin is has been circumcised off. It means that sin 
What sin used to be to you is no longer sin to you anymore. I'm not speaking of the act. I'm speaking of the effect. That's the mature interpretation. Are you, are you guys with me? So if you've done that sin before you were saved, it was an actual sin. But now after you're saved, your sin is no longer a sin to you. Because the penalty of sin has been dealt with. The power of sin has been dealt with. The presence of sin is being dealt with. So it, sin is the only sin that a believer can commit is the sin of unbelief. Go read it in your Bible. What does the New Testament say sin is? For whatever is not of faith is sin. When it's unbelief, it's sin. So actually, how many are sinning actually here? You're trying to stop all these other works, but you have unbelief to God towards your finances. You have unbelief to God towards your healing. You have unbelief even to God towards your salvation. You don't have the assurance of salvation. So you're in sin. You're a double-minded man. And God does not answer a double-minded man. When you are unbelief, you are in sin. So now I'm in sin because I doubt my salvation. Are you guys with me? So that is the mature interpretation. For those that want to cut this and call me a heretic, you can go ahead because I'll give the sugar-coated one for you now. Okay. That is the mature interpretation. That sin is no longer sin to you. But now they will come with the argument and say that um, they will say that now you have a license to sin. And they will say that now we're giving you, now we say, how dare heresy, we say you can get saved and go carry on sinning. Listen to me. Put on Romans chapter number 6 verse 18. Romans 6 verse 18. Let's go break I would be carrying on this message tonight, but then I know not a lot of you are going to come because you had spring day yesterday. Being then made free from sin. No, no, no. That's not the one I'm looking for. Uh, maybe it is 13. The one of dominion. 14, 14, 14. 6 verse 14. For sin, say with me, for sin shall not have dominion over me. For I am not under the law, but under grace. So when you're truly under grace, sin you will not go have a license to sin. You would not want to go sin. Are you guys with me? There would not be no lifestyle of sin because grace, provenient grace, justifying grace, salvation grace has done its full work in you. You were holy and fully saved. So those who are saying, but you're going to go backside and sin, their hearts are wicked. Not your heart. If the grace of God had its work in your life and you understand the word that I'm preaching to you, you will know that you have no desire to carry on sinning. And even if you do, the discipline of God will come and nudge you out of the way or pull you out of the way and you will be a miserable, uncomfortable life. Are you guys with me? Say sin has no dominion over me. When I'm under grace, but let me tell you to whom it has dominion over, to those who are under the law, where they keep measuring themselves and they keep saying, because of this works, I am good here. Because I'm praying here, I am good here. Because of this, I'm, that's, no, 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 no. You are in new age self-worship. You are an idol worshiper. You made a God out of yourself and you say you can save yourself. Are you guys with me? I want this word to penetrate you. So you will have no desire to sin. Uh, the second evidence. So the sugar-coated way says that sin has no power over you. I mean, the, the, the mature way says sin has no power over you. Now the body of sins have been cut off, put off. Does that mean that you can go on sinning? No, there is a judgment for sins. Just not in heaven, on the earth. So the more you sin, the more God disciplines you. That discipline can even go so far as sickness coming upon you and death. 
Are you guys with me? I'll teach on it next week. So when you as a child, when your child, your daughter, listen, always look at the relationship with God as a father-son relationship. Always. If your child sins against you, what do you do? You give them a hiding, I hope. Are you guys with me? Not, not, what do they call it? What do they call it? Um, Silent, what do they call it? Huh? Huh? Time out. There's one thing we knew. It was not time out. <laughs> um, teach the child the way they will go and they will go that way. Spare not the rod. It's not child abuse. Relax. It will save your child from death. You are messing up because you might not have had it. Are you guys with me? I can't discipline my daughters, so my wife has to discipline them. Because I feel too sorry for them. Uh, <laughs> So, now I'm still a voice of discipline and authority in the house. It's just better for my stomach if I sit like this. So, um, I'm still a voice of discipline and authority, obviously. But um, God disciplines you. So, look at the relationship as a father-son relationship. Sin has a judgment. Not in heaven because I'll get in and I'll explain next week how we won't be judged. In fact, how there's no judgment against us. But on this earth, there's a judgment of sins. Sins has to be judged on this earth because the Bible says the consequence of sin is death. So sometimes if a person, even a man of God would get so bad in their, weak, in their wickedness that God will have to remove them. Knowing that they'll be in heaven, people on your earth think God is killing people. No, He's not killing, He's putting them to sleep. Christians don't die. Are you guys with me? Christians sleep. And they'll be awakened. So say with me, a desire to stop sinning. So now let's go to the sugar-coated way, what this verse actually means. Also, it's another interpretation. There are two schools of interpretation here. Another interpretation, which is the more accepted one and the more uh, the right one to preach in a public way, is that it may, speaks of habitual, continual sinning. That the Greek word cannot, uh, does not sin means that you cannot regularly carry on sinning. So the moment you've experienced true salvation, you cannot carry on drinking that Jack Daniels like you used to all the time and getting drunk and beating your wife all the time. If you are, it is a good sign that salvation might not have done its full work in you. Are you guys with me? So I'll have a desire for not sinning, meaning the seed of God is in me, the sperma of God. When God's seed is in me, there will be a desire to stop habitually sinning. Not by my own works, I'll just have no desire. If I can carry on the way I used to carry on and live the way I used to, with no nature change, and I just, there's absolutely no change about me, and I can carry on doing every sin, and no voice of conviction or is speaking to me, or the discipline of God is speaking to me, it means that maybe my salvation was not true. Are you guys with me? So this is the second evidence. I'm not even going to get into the third evidence. I want to close it off here because otherwise the message is going to go off balance. Say with me, am I, and I'm going to give you eight or nine, hey, by next week, we'll be finished. Say with me, am I 100% sure that I am saved? I just gave you two signs that must be in your life and I'm going to give you more. Let's stand to our feet wherever we are. Raise your hands to the Lord. Raise your hands to the Lord. I'm going to ask Pastor Martin to pray. I'm going to ask him to, to close off and do an altar call for those who feel that their hearts are not right. They don't have 100% assurance for salvation. Maybe you thought you were a Christian, but, but you don't have that 100% assurance. I want you to make it right today for me. It is very important. And then we're going to carry on with this message. 
um, next week Sunday. Amen. So in light of what was just said, if I can ask everyone to remain standing with no hands raised, but every eye closed, this is an extremely sensitive part of the service. If I may please ask, no hands raised now, but every eye closed. My prophet just stated that if you're standing here right now in light of what was shared, and you are not 100% sure, I don't need to really go into depth now. It was shared this morning. If I might ask you to raise your hands for a moment. And I see hands going up. I see the hands going up. I want to give it a moment because many people struggle with this part. If you're standing next to someone that you know that they should respond to this call, just give them a nudge. Tell them that, listen, I'm here with you. I will do this thing with you. I see more hands going up. If I, if I may ask you to raise your hands high for me. Keep it up. No one looking around. I see more hands coming up. I want to give it a moment. If you hear that voice inside of your heart saying, respond to this call, rather just be, just, just raise your hand. Respond to that call. Be obedient to that voice. Rather safe than sorry. I see more hands going up. Just keep your hands up for me. If I may ask the ushers to locate those raising their hands. I want to give it a moment. I see more hands going up. Thank you for responding to this call. Even those connecting online, if you're saying that's me, you can just comment in the chat section saying it's me. I'll be praying a prayer with each and every one of you in this morning. That from this moment forward, may you believe with all your hearts and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, that He indeed died upon a cross for all your sins, that this will be a moment of true repentance, meaning a complete change of hearts, a complete change of mind, making a conscious decision to turn the other way. And as Prophet stated with the ABCs, we'll be getting into the C part where you'll confess with your mouth. Amen. I still see hands going up. I just want to make sure there's still hands going up. Amen. You may lower your hands. I'll be praying a prayer with each and every one of you. Let this come from your hearts. Acknowledge that your dependency is locked up in Him. That there is nothing that I can do without Him. Amen. I want the entire church to pray this prayer after me, especially in support to those who have raised their hands. And the usher standing by those who have responded to this call, you can just place your hands upon them and help them pray this prayer, saying, Holy Father, I ask of your forgiveness for every sin I'm guilty of, every transgression, Every inequity, I ask of your forgiveness. Everything in my life at this moment that is wrong in your eyes, everything that I have done that you do not approve of, I repent. I ask of your forgiveness. Every known sin, even every unknown sin that might have gone hidden, I ask of your forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ. I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God and that He died on a cross for all my sins, for all my sins. 
Father, I pray as such, may you wash me, may you cleanse me by the blood of the Lamb. May you set me free from my spirit of unbelief. And this morning, I receive a full measure of your forgiveness. Father, I confess that in the name of Jesus Christ, hell is far from me, that heaven is close to me, that heaven is my destination. Lord, I love you. I give you all the glory. I give you all the honor. And I give you all the praise. In the living name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Come on, let's just give God a praise offering. Then for those who have responded to this call, if I may ask you to remain behind for five minutes, there's an usher standing by your side. They're going to pray with you. They will minister on to you. Please do not leave until they have done so. That is extremely important. Even those online who have responded to the call, if I may ask you to head over to our Global Prayer Alliance. We have a team on standby that is ready to pray for you, to minister on to you right now. Amen. Thank you so much, Encounter. Then tonight... At 4 p.m., I, I always say this, and then I only see a handful of people. And so I have many people that is lying, saying that they'll be here, and then they're not here. On this topic. So at 4 p.m., who will I see at 4 p.m. for prayer? See, now there's at least honest people that's just not raising their hands, like, listen, just, I'm not going to be here. Let's start. What's happening at 4 p.m.? Where? What? When? (laughs) Just again, raising by your hands. Who will I see 4 p.m. for prayer? If you're not raising your hands, I will come and raise your hand for you. Okay, everyone raising their hands. Keep your hands up for me, please. Okay, those, I want you to turn to your neighbor. Okay, look at, look at those raising their hands, please. Get their details. If they're not here at 4 p.m., you phone them and say, you said that you'll be here. Where are you? Come on, accountability. I'm serious. Are you guys with me? Get their details now. And if you do not see your partner here at 4 p.m., you phone them and ask, where are you? It's 4 p.m. We're about, maybe you forgot. We start, can I come fetch you? Amen. Amen. 4 p.m. what? Where? Okay, that will lead effectively to the service starting at 5 p.m. Love you and see you later. Give into this ministry. We have made giving your tithes, seed, or offering as simple and effortless as possible. You can simply log on to encounterchurch.co.za or leondupria.com and click on the Give button. Here we show you the different ways to give. It's so easy. You will find giving options for local or international giving. PayFast is a fast and secure way for South Africans to give. You can give once off or make a recurring donation. Here you will find the Zapper and SnapScan QR codes as a simple and effortless way to scan and give into the ministry. If you prefer to make an electronic transfer, the banking details of our various campuses and the Visionary Fund are also readily available. For giving internationally, Cash App is one of our fast and simple giving platforms. PayPal is another method for quick and easy giving internationally. You can use your PayPal account or you can give straight from your credit card. DonorBox is also available, which accepts a variety of international giving methods. For those who would like to take hands with us and become a part of the incredible work that God is doing, become a friend and partner of Encounter and Leon Dupria. We have many partnership tiers available to suit your preference. Our friends and partners receive exclusive materials from Leon Dupria, as well as private live streams and exclusive events. Thank you for being part of what God is doing.